together. First order of business, Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Have any changes, omissions, or removal from the agenda? None that I'm aware of. Um, okay. Section 220 Zoning Permits Village Bylaws. Miss Carter. Yes, please. So, you know, I had eyelid surgery on Thursday, so I'm all swollen and weird looking. Hi, Jeannie. <laughs> I like the fashion statement nonetheless. <laughs> okay, I'm probably going to have to take these off. Um, okay, so I, I know you were concerned about what we added to 220 at the end about having to get a permit for any kind of interior. And yes, has to go back and rework that. So I went back to the Planning Commission and we, were, we reworked it so it would have a 10th K threshold that if you're going to spend more than 10k you're going to have to get um, a permit but other than that you're okay I know we went back and forth because you know Ryan is pretty informed about how this works and he's figures people will say they're not spending 10k but then in the end they'll end up spending 10k and not go get a permit but we just wanted something on the mm -hmm. books to guide it in some ways so I sent that to Patrick I mean to Chris Callahan our zoning lawyer with Brendan's permission, because I know it costs money to send things to him. Um, and he and I had a long com telephone conversation about it. He's used to Chittenden County where they have building inspectors and he goes, oh, what you need is a building permit, not a zoning permit. They should get a building permit. And you know, it's like, we don't have a building <laughs> inspector. We don't have a building permit. So then he had to rethink the whole thing. And he, at first he thought the 10K was not legal, but then he went back and said that it was. But he sent this language um, instead, which he recommends, but I'll see what you guys want to do. So his language he wanted us, that he suggested we use, is a permit shall be required for any of the following interior alterations, increased in habitable living space, including but not limited to attic, bedroom, basement, garage, and winterizing or otherwise enclosing a porch. Number two, installation of an additional kitchen. Number three, a change in use. Number four, a home occupation. Number five, an increase or decrease in the number of bedrooms or units. And number six, any interior construction costing or valued at 10 grand or more. So he did say the 10 grand or more was legit. And I know you wanted to keep the number of bedrooms in there. You guys were clear about that last time. So what we had written, the planning commission, what we were gonna to bring to you is a permit shall be required for any interior structural alterations that change the number of bedrooms or has a total cost exceeding 10 grand. So those are the two suggestions we have for, you know, for our homework assignment that you wanted us to go back and reword it. So I guess I'd just like to know your preference and whatever you decide, I'll change it in the official document. I have a question, Terry. Yeah. When you add a kitchen, doesn't that make possible an additional living unit? Yeah, lockout, which I think is why he wants to include right. that. Okay, that's yeah. what I was thinking. Thank you. Yep. Um, did you have something, Justin? I, I think it's great. I appreciate Mr. Callahan's input. Um, the one thing I was questioning is increase in habitable living space, including but not limited to. Um, I like the language including but not limited to. We hit most of the things. What happens if somebody wants to turn a closet into a bathroom? Yeah, it doesn't say anything about bathrooms anywhere, does it? And bathrooms affect your water and stuff if you're on water and sewer. They actually don't. Oh, they don't? Okay. No, you could, Mr. Silvestri might be able to that, that's right. yeah, take the floor. Only yeah. so, so water and sewer is based on bedroom count. So changing a closet to a bathroom, if it's under that $10,000 10, uh, threshold, do it. You know, which I would say you're, you could do. That's kind of that. No, the more I thought about that number, the more it made sense. Good luck doing a bathroom reno under 10K, usually. <laughs> it's tough Especially nowadays. 
Um, it's small. It's a, so it's including, but not limited to does include certain things as long as it's over the $10,000 threshold. Yeah. So really we're trying to, we're trying to chase value. So it's when, you know, properties are assessed at 500,000, they get, you know, hundred thousand dollar renovation to them and then sell and we're way off that affects the town CLA mm -hmm. you know um, people will go people will flip to a non-conforming structure if say they finish the barn you know the barn is a 1600 square foot barn they're on a small lot and by finishing that barn now they're over their um, threshold for density you know so change in use um, business use so our home occupation it, it's, it makes sense. It won't necessarily affect the value because people don't people don't always physically build an office. They just use their dining room as their office or a portion of their building as an office or home occupation. That's more important for me for tax filing because they'll file business use of their residential building and the portion that they claim then gets taxed at the non-residential tax rate. So some people in the non-residential tax rate in most case in Ludlow is typically less than the residential tax rate. So some people file 50% or 75% of their home as business use. And I have really no recourse to challenge that because I don't know, you know, we, we didn't know that they were doing it. We, I call the state, they don't really know. So this would at least help us identify the areas in homes in which people are using for home occupation. You weren't present on the June meeting when we discussed this in no, the original I, I, time. No, I wasn't, no. Do, does this new definition um, help you? Chris's language is, is much more thorough. I, I like it. I like it more than what we have, what we said we had suggested. Yeah, I liked it too. I, I yeah. agree. I liked it. I think it's really thorough. Uh, so. Thank you, Mr. Silvestri. Do we need like a motion or anything? Or is it yeah, I, I think so. I yeah. believe we do. And any other comments on that? Right. Can I yeah. make a motion? I, I, actually, I do. Oh, a okay, sorry. Okay. Mostly um, just because we're right now working on the village document, right? There are about 150 condos in the village. There's over, there's a thousand in the town. So this cannot just be written in the village document. It cannot. I emphasize that it must be written into the town bylaws as well. Mrs. Carter, you've, you're the chair of the planning commission. We haven't been approached about changing any of the bylaws in the town document as of now, correct? Yeah, we haven't, but we could change them all at the same time. But we, I don't know it, if that has to go to the planning commission first. So. Uh, we're going to... It doesn't have to go to the planning commission yet. Your artist would be once you get it where you want it. It's your U.S. Senate. Yeah. Okay, but so I, let's get on the horn and ask the town select board uh, what they think about maybe adding this onto the agenda for next month and seeing where it goes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Spesser. Good point. So you were making a... Can we make a motion on our board yet? Is that yeah, appropriate? I think yeah. we're, so we're ready. Good. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I apologize. I'm thinking a way, a cleaner way to do this. Maybe you can make a motion to accept this language pending the town's approval, because uh, you, you don't want this in one and not the other. I know we're talking merger and stuff like that. You can't do that because it hasn't been warned at the town level. It hasn't. Yeah. Well, I, I'll just so again, I, I'm not you know the the actual nuts and bolts of this, but I, I am emphasizing like emphatically. This must be done in the town. It's more important in the town than the village. So I know we're at a village trustee meeting, but I don't know if I don't know if you want to pass it now or wait until the t the town maybe a joint meeting. But I kind of like to make a motion. Think about the nuts and bolts of it. I like to make at the village level now. Sure. I'd like to make a motion to just move it on. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, Mr. Silvestri, you have my word as another member of the select board that I will uh, keep on this and make sure that it's mentioned and we're aware of it. So my motion would be that we accept the changes per the proposed language from Chris Callahan for section 2220. I second that motion. Okay, any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye.
Thank you, Mrs. Carter. That was that was a good yeah, section there. <laughs> that was a fun one. Um, lot coverage in all districts of village bylaws. Do you want me to give a summary of what happened so far? Yes, please. Okay. okay, so at the June meeting, um, you the, select, the trustees expressed a desire to change lot coverage because we had made it much smaller than it was in the original. Um, before the new zoning goes through, it was much smaller. I have all the details here. Mm -hmm. And then Martha sent me an email from regional that reminding me that do they understand the new definition of lot coverage because we changed the definition of lot coverage to include everything like all driveways sheds everything and the house itself and i said yeah i don't think i was clear about that so i sent that language to all of you guys and um i found out that you would want to take, want to take another look at that so just the history of what we have so far so in the preservation district um the lot coverage was at 12 percent the planning commission changed it to 65 percent and then the trustees changed it in june to 20 percent and so now um i'd like to know since now you know what law coverage the reason why we changed the definition is because there were four different definitions for lot coverage one was like a definition for law another was lot coverage another was coverage so we just lumped it all together to just have one definition that covers everything that anyone does on their lot so I guess I'd like to maybe we could go district district by district to see what would be your preferred percentage. Right now it's at twenty percent in the preservation Carter. district. Pardon my my memory's lapsing apparently. Did we pass the village R two district in the June meeting? In the June meeting, we talked about everything except the village residential commercial, which is my bad because I didn't put it in the summary. And that's at 75%. That's what we changed it to in the planning commission. So that's something that we you know, need to discuss. So I don't know if you want to go district by district. I think that's the best way. Okay. Um, and I just want to make sure the Andover section that we were speaking about creating a new district back yep. in June, that was passed at that June meeting or was it Right, yes. You guys today? said you were in favor of that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. So now knowing that in the preservation district, lot coverage includes all driveways, sheds, whatever, any outbuildings they have, including their house, barn. Do you want to leave it at 20%? Well, now it's a little, uh, yeah, go ahead, Miss. I've, I've been struggling with this. Um, I, I think we should have green space, but it's including driveways, patios. <coughs> uh, sheds. Sheds, um, and, and if, you counted those in at 20%, um, that would be a pretty pretty small house. Um, and I'm, I've been trying to come up with some way to, to make a visual because just just looking at the numbers is, is not working that well. Yeah, and Bob, I know you asked me to I come function. asked me to come up with a visual line. I did research online and lot coverage online is about warehouses and big boxes and stuff and I couldn't find anything, but I did email um, Jason at Regional and Martha and Allison and they sent a picture of the Homestyle Hostel, which I sent to all you guys showing how much of the Homestyle Hotel, I mean, how much of it is covered. And I did forward that to all you guys through email to get an idea of lot coverage because you pretty much got the whole lot covered there as you need to. Yeah, no, that's uh, not really residential but so here's my question hmm. what towns if any are disagreeing with the state over these changes i don't i don't i don't know i know rose and chris callahan in the beginning wanted us to disagree with it and chris was really interpreting the language as a lawyer and i at one of our meetings i brought up that idea and at first, we were all for it, and then regional like got so angry with us. They said we weren't acting in good faith. We understand what the state means. We're not, you know, we're not doing it correctly. They got how really angry with us. Regional, what? But how often has regional visited here? Well, Jason, Jason comes a lot, and, yeah. he's, the, and he's the 
head. Like he's helping us right now with flood management and stuff. Because they has- come by and looked at the lot coverage percentages and. Well, they're the ones that, that wanted, maybe. they are the ones that encouraged us to increase it because our grant was about in creating, creating housing. So that's why they wanted us to increase lot coverage. I guess what I'm getting at is I don't want to be rushed into some state regs yeah. built by a regional planning commission that may be based in Windsor. That's not right. based in Lumbo. But the state regs don't say anything about lot coverage. They don't say anything about that. That was something Martha encouraged us to look at. It, that wasn't changed. Density was changed but not lot coverage in those state regs. Hmm. So it can be anything you want it to be until they change it. And then we get into, you guys wanted to do a uniform blanket lot coverage definition, which does make sense, but then it blankets sheds and impervious materials and it encompasses a lot of things. Non-permeable surfaces. Yes. Yeah, which is what, what was not clear at our public hearing with you guys. I'm sorry. I'm uh, you, you were clear about that with us. Right. Yeah. I, I remember that I, discussion. I understood that. Um, and that, that's why I was wondering about the 20% we came up because that's going to be a pretty small house. Right. If you have a 20 by 40 foot driveway into a garage, um, that, that in the preservation district, much. Bob, does that affect a lot? Is is there anything that's not built except for that He's one lot in the preservation district? I don't know. Bob, can Ryan speak? May, yes, may go, I, go ahead, Ryan. So, I so at twenty percent, that puts most all these all the parcels existing non-conforming. So you're going to be creating any vacant land that's left. You're going to be creating non-conforming lots. Um, it's also the whole point of this grant is to increase opportunity, increase living units and density. So um, I just want to remind you of the theme of this. So 20% going more restrictive when the whole goal of this is the exact opposite is to create more opportunity. I just question that, um, you know, and it's just something where you can still maintain aesthetic. You can still maintain, you know, your green space, your setbacks from the road, stuff like that but the percentage of lot coverage is very important because we can say we're encouraging this new construction, we're encouraging this unit this unit um, creation, but then if you put the lot coverage back down to 20, it contradicts everything else that you're looking to change. So I just wanted you to keep that in mind. I have a question. Is it? I had, a, I had a question just for Ryan. That's correct. Thank you. I just, just from living here and everything, when they wanted to increase the housing, was it for second homeowners? Because it seems like there's, we're not creating any more affordable housing by that change, by making more. Yeah. It doesn't seem like we're getting, I see people converting their garages into Airbnbs. Sure. Is the point that the, the state so, was trying to make to make it more affordable housing? So the point the point of all this is to allow de- is to allow developers to come in or make developers want to come in and create volume of housing. So apartment buildings. No one wants to hear it's you know, I understand it's very different from what Vermont is used to, but that's what will solve a lot of our problems. All of our problems go back to housing. There's not enough of it. So when you start in, you know, encouraging or becoming less restrictive so that you can build these large, these large, you know, volume unit, you know, you know, buildings, that's, what's going to solve. That's what we're trying to allow in some, in some regard, at least that's in my opinion. And that's what I think that's definitely where the state's coming from. The, the state saying this is very, is very important because they're saying, listen, anywhere where you have town water and sewer, we need to build units. We need to build units, uh, you know, where but we're do, short. But do we? I, I mean, my question, I'm serious, I'm asking is yep. if 95% of the people that own property in Vermont in, in the village is very high. Yep. Are we are we creating housing that is needed? Or are we creating more Airbnbs? I just don't see it. I'm just taking the preservation unit as, yep. as it is. Are we creating... Yeah, is your outlook that they're going to create buildings that people can live and work in Ludlow? I, I, I can't. I, can't I think Ludlow predict. is very different than the state. You know, our town is very different than a lot of towns. Yeah, but I mean, it's all, but it's also similar to a lot of towns as well. All you know, all your resort towns. That's that's the struggle here, right? Resort town or or family community. Right. So, and I get that. I mean, it's I can't. I wouldn't sit up here and speculate what someone is going to plan to build or wants to build. 
you know, so it's, but it's something where that's the decision to make. Do you want to allow for more opportunity for projects like that to potentially happen or, or not, you know, but obviously the problem is there's a huge shortage of, of housing units. I think we should go section by section, um, district by district and try to uh, move forward with this. So the basic, the minimum lot size is 8712. Correct, that's the bare minimum, that's the smallest parcel of land that you can purchase. So at that, 20% of that is 1,742.4 square foot. Now that doesn't include pavement, doesn't include a shed or what, what whatever you would like. So. That's, that's pretty small. You had something, Eric, you wanted to say? Go ahead. Eric Alden, Trailside Road. Uh, I just wanted to piggyback on on the question there. Um, and it, it simply comes down to if you want affordable housing, you have to have density. Without density, you will not have affordable housing. So it is a balance. And um, no one is going to come in and, you know, on, on any lots that are that are overly restrictive. And there are ways to control what type of housing is built, uh, you know, through zoning, through the planning commission, through bylaws. You can add, uh, I think the planning commission was working on some of those. A certain percentage has to be affordable. You know, those are controls that the town can put in place. So if you're concerned about someone coming in and over developing or building, you know, Airbnbs, there's a way to control that. If someone wants to build 10 units, then 30% of them have to be affordable. You can put restrictions on it in, in that sense. Uh, and the other piece, just on the, the lot density, uh, in a lot of towns, sheds um, under a certain size aren't included. So like in most towns, it's 150 square feet. So if you have a, a 10 by 15 shed, that doesn't count towards your lot um, you know, density. Thank you, Mr. Alden. It would be nice, and I hear... Um, the, I, I hear the passion in passion speech and I know it's been a while coming and I think that this town does need more housing. Um, and I, I like Mr. Alden's idea about including a shed in, you know, not including that in the lot coverage or something. There's ways to do that. Um, the question is, do we pass this now without those bylaws and mechanisms in place and the language in place? Please. Okay. So later on in this document, which we already went over this part, the affordable affordability requirement, that's what I think Eric Alden is talking about. And this is from the state. This is a state, new state reg. The minimum of 15% of all units developed um, have to be affordable of any new housing project. And all areas served by both municipal sewer and water inf infrastructure, affordable housing development, including mixed use development, must exceed density limitations for residential developments by an additional 40% and may exceed height limitations by one floor provided the structure complies with the Vermont Fire and Housing Safety Code. So those are in place. And you guys, I already went over that with you guys because it's a, this state, I think it became. That's right, we went over that in June. Yeah. And I think also what Eric was saying was the shed already, and Ryan said it too, the shed already isn't included and that it isn't currently. It's not a bylaw. It's already included. So, so I think I haven't actually measured and I don't have a one fifth lot. I, I have the quarter acre. Um, if you measured my house, my driveway, garage, my shed, I'm probably close to 50%. And I, I have a lot of green space still at, at my house. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I think we could go up on that at 20%. Um, to some point, I, I'm not, not sure about the 75%. Um, and remember, these big housing units that are going to be affordable housing developments 
can exceed by 40% what we have put in place. So if we had 60% put in place and a 30 apartment complex wanted to build, they could get 100% based on that. And another floor. And another floor, they can add another floor too. So it does incentivize, I guess, larger developments by the state regs already. Yeah. Um, granted our 20% after hearing Mr. Silvestri's concerns and Mr. Alden's points and your own, I think that 20 would be low because yeah. even with that 40, they're still only at 60. So it would make sense uh, to me, just based on what I've he heard here tonight, to put it to 60 or 65%. What are your thoughts? Preservation only? Yes, we're going district to district, aren't we? Yeah. Is that correct? So we're at the preservation, which is bridge to bridge, yes. more or less? Well, Kirk Bright's house, Kirk Bright's house is a bridge. I don't know where that was, I'm sorry. Nice school. school. Right by the high school. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, because um, that section of Main Street from Commonwealth down would be in there as well. Yeah, I stand behind that. Um, what was your suggestion? How much? I said between 60 and 65, and I haven't made a motion, but that's me thinking out loud. I think that we just have to, when we make the vote, just consider why the preservation district was created. Mm -hmm. It was created to keep the core of Ludlow preserved, in, in my eyes. I was there when they were starting to you know, make some of those changes, too. I just... If I really thought that any of these buildings were going to include people that were locals or people that could benefit, that work and live in this town, I'd feel a lot more lenient that way. But I just feel like it's not going to happen. I'm watching all these sheds turn into houses now. And where we live, we're on our way up to our house, their porch is turning into a kitchen. It's not going to turn into houses for people that can afford it. That's right. It just isn't. I mean, if we know that, if you know that going in. But I think we're blind if we pretend that people are going to say, oh, now we're going to build a house so somebody can afford to live here. Because just look at the rentals in Ludlow. Yeah, I don't, I don't. The rentals aren't for us. I don't think he's, they're hoping a developer would come in and buy a vacant lot and put in a multi-unit. Are there any vacant lots in the preservation district? There's one. There's one. There's where one. The, remember where the tent stone sure. house was? That's yeah. the only one that I drove by because I was trying to figure out where they'd be. Unless there's another we don't know about. Yeah. Eric? Just quickly, without with all due respect to the, the board here, those, those statements are why there's no housing built anywhere because no one wants it here. They want housing, but they don't want it in their town. So if you want housing in this town, you have to work towards that. We can yeah. agree to disagree on that. Yeah, no. I don't think that we're getting, if yeah. you're saying that you think that people are going to purchase you know, under this plan, they're going to increase to people, the people who live here. I just don't think that I can what agree I'm, with that. Statement. What I'm saying is if there's not density, no one is ever going to build. And you'll have, you will never increase your housing stock. So you, you can't have it both ways. Most of the time you can't have affordable housing but also massive restrictions that do not allow for development. Um. So it seems like the state has written in a lot of these laws and kind of circumvented um, the municipalities. So we're working within the parameters of what's set forth from the state. <laughs> um, so I believe last meeting about this in June, I made the mention of, well, if a minimum of 15% of all units have to be developed as part of a housing project have to be affordable, doesn't that then qualify them for um, the other sections that might be beneficial? So it seemed kind of double language. I'm sure the state's going to work these out in the future and we're going to be privy to them after the fact. Um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sitting here thinking, Mrs. Carter used home style as an example, which is my business. I have a front lot and then I have all pavement because I had to have parking in order to open my business. 
And then I have a barn that's been there forever in the back. Um, that takes up, I don't have it in front of me, but I'm going to assume probably 80%, maybe 85% with just my green in the front. Um, and I'm not sure if, you know, dropping, dropping these, I'm not sure if dropping the density or raising the density is going to incentivize one way or another short-term rentals per se. I do think that Mr. Alden's kind of playing the developer when he's coming up here saying, well, you know, what's in it for the developer to bring housing here? So I don't know. I'm going to, I'm going to probably stick to a higher than 20. Yeah, I, I, I'm perfectly fine higher than 20. I'm just not sure I'm not at 60 yet. I just think the preservation district, we have to think of it as a district, how much building is left. What would you there. be comfortable with? Because I, remember, they'll stop gap in another 40%. I totally understand that. On that. I'm just saying that if you can even come to a compromise between there, 40, 45. I just feel like to go 60 is just so much different. I hear you. Especially for the word preservation. Because they just think about why they call it that, the preservation district. They wanted to preserve that. Yeah, I mean, Area, but, so I but think. you look at the main main part of it, and it's building to building. It's yeah. already there, yeah. So how much it's more do you want to put in there as well, wow. I guess I'm saying? If you want to add up stories to all them? Well, you can't go more than three, if I read right. Correct. Also, I'm it too. 35 feet or three. Unless it's affordable. Um, Julie, I hear you, and you've, you've made um, some impassioned points. So well, thank you. you compromise it a amount I'm definitely I mean it's a three member board you you can yeah. decide do, do I have a motion either way <laughs> <laughs> you had one down there I didn't I didn't make a motion okay. yet um, okay I will make a motion okay. to change the village preservation district density from a lot coverage. lot coverage, sorry, lot so, coverage from 12%, which is what it currently is, to 45%. I'll second that. Okay, any more discussion? Oh. That makes it eligible for up to 85% on the lot if they meet their affordable housing and maximize that additional return. Does that satisfy um, the Planning Commission's work on this? Is there a... Uh, we've got a new Planning Commission, so we have a genie, so I don't even know how long we go now. Because we've been spending energy to the Ryan's right there. Yeah. 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 I guess I'm looking for a little bit of input on, is this going to make a difference going from 20 to 45, or is it not going to make a difference because it was set at 75? Started at twelve. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. Thank, thank, thank you. Yes. Ryan. Yeah. It's so you know. My thoughts here: are apartment buildings, right? So, if you're a developer and you have eighty-five percent of a lot to build an apartment building on, you're likely not. It's likely not going to make the cut because you have to have the non-permeable surfaces for paving, parking. Um, you know, stuff like that. So even with the, with the 40%. So, you know, if that's, in, in my opinion, that's what we're trying to, that's what we're trying to foster. Um, I'll also say this, in my opinion, that a developer that's going to come in and do a 40 unit apartment building, right? They're not going to, it's not going to be a short term rental. Think about, think about the time and think about the, the inconsistency and the risk. Why would you only, why would you build a 40 unit building for a seasonal rental where you have to basically schedule people in three night increments, right? As opposed to building a 40 unit building with year long leases and running like a 20% or 15% vacancy rate. You're yeah. alluding to the fact, I believe that a lot of people afford second homes by renting them out when they're not up here, so, which then stimulates the single home economy. But, not the and, apartment and, that, and that's not what we're trying to foster with this. We're trying mm -hmm. to foster the large scale 30 plus I understand. unit buildings. I understand that you know, difference. So that people can afford to live here. It's a big difference. Thank you, Mr. Sylvester, for pointing that out. May I ask a question? Um, Jeannie, you've been in town for a long time and, and um, 
Julie has. I was on the boards when they did the preservation district. And Julie has reminded us, and if you weren't here, people were emphatic about maintaining that area, that one small area, as a preservation district. They didn't call it historic because that would be, I think that was way too involved, but Jeannie, do you recall any of it? I, I recall, not specifically, but I recall all those discussions. It would seem to me that 45% is, um, it's a compromise. Um, and it's, if you're just talking about the preservation district, that's all. So that, that's my take on my personal take. Are we going to be caught flat-footed where developers aren't going to want to develop there because it's only 85%? I, um, I, my take on that is, is that there's a lot of other places in the town and the village where developers could choose to develop and they would probably be more suitable for a large housing development like Ryan just talked about. That's I don't think you're going to... Might not be on water, municipal water and sewer infrastructure, though, yeah, which... There are other places in the village that are not in the preservation district. That's my point. And I think you can see what the other districts are like. I am worried by Section 290 that says all areas served by both municipal sewer and water infrastructure are eligible for the 40%, which means places that are not on municipal water and sewer wouldn't be eligible for that 40%. So that means the percentages should be in theory higher outside of places that aren't. Um, so that circles back to Ms. Strong's point that we could have a lower density in the preservation district because they are eligible for that 40% increase, alluding to your 45% being a good middle ground, I suppose. It's a compromise that did you follow through that? I followed that. Um, and, and I think uh, Julie's more, more concerned someone's going to come in and put up a single family home that takes up all that space. Um, and we're kind of defeating the purpose, but we're, we're not going to be able to control that. So, and they wouldn't get the 40%. So. <gasps> Um, That's correct. It would be capped at 45 or whatever. Right. Um, we decided on. So I think we have a motion and a second. Is that correct? Absolutely. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, yes, please. Okay. Okay, next district would be Village Residential. It was currently at 30% non-residential, like offices and stuff, and 50% residential. The Planning Commission changed it to 75% on both. And then the trustees in June changed it back to 50% residential, 30% non-residential. Village Residential's served by municipal water and sewer as well. Right, and actually we could probably talk about R2 at the same time because though we had we had identical statistics for that. R2 is the Our new Andover formed Street. one in Andover Street? Just Andover Street, yeah. And that goes until what point? It starts at um, the end of Bridge Street there, right up into um, uh, Pilatus Hill. Pilatus Hill was half commercial the other half of the road was um, was um, residential. Is Pilatus Hill the empty lot right after the bridge? Right across from Tony's, that hill right after Tony's. Hemingway Hill? Is it Hemingway, Hemingway Hill. Hill. Oh, Hemingway Hill. I've got it wrong. Okay. Hemingway Hill. So that road, right down the middle of that, it was residential. This side was commercial. You guys agreed to change it all to residential. And, yeah, so those, just, those two stats for... 
Village R and Village R2, if you want to talk about them together. Um, they're currently at 30% non-residential and 50% residential. And the Planning Commission had changed it to 75%. So um, again, they are in theory eligible for a 40% bonus because they're hooked up to the water and sewer if they're doing affordable housing, which is what we're trying to generate. Yep. So with that being said, I actually feel pretty good about our percentages from June. Me too. Um, but it's just me. The 30% non-residential and the 50% residential for both That would only give you seventy percent. Ninety percent would be. Well, there's not going to be very much uh, non-residential. It's all. It's all. It's all residential. Too. Right. There's no no more commercial on R two, except for existing. So we are going to probably do these separate then, because village residential does have non residential. Yeah, the R two is mostly just residential. We took out all the stuff that. Bob, do you know that? Are all the res residential, village residential, are they all on sewer and water? Because I think there's a couple, there's like the one on the top of Doug Road, I don't think is on the town water. It's on, it's on water. They yeah, they dug up. across the... Yeah, they are. I saw the, the fire hydrant, but which I watched them before. I, I'm just curious if they all are, because I heard some of them in the village weren't on sewer and water. I, there was I some don't think gonna... they connected to the sewer. I think Brian's spoken to this before, that they all can get on it, but all, not all have chosen to. Yeah. That's what it is. They aren't, they aren't on the sewer. Right. They're on, that's, that's what I know. I just wanted to clarify that. Mrs. Carter, what's your recommendation as it stands now based on our discussions from section 420 and 425 for the village residential percentages. I think my recommendation would be to put it at 50% of both. I don't understand why the village residential is going to be lower. Residential would be the same. Any thoughts on that, Ryan? Yeah, I would agree with that for 50%. For, for both makes sense. Yeah, considering the only real commercial property we're allowing in either is just an auto body without the ability to sell vehicles. So, makes sense. Thank you. He's probably already at 50%. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, do we find it, we do find it pertinent to add the non residential and residential distinction if we go with 50%? I guess it, it's null and it wouldn't matter. I think it's I don't believe you need the distinction. You could just say 50 for, for everything. Mrs. Carter, as chair of the planning commission, are you okay with that? Do you feel comfortable with that? Is that in line with your yeah. thought process? Yeah. That's where it is. Uh, Fellow board members, how do we feel about that? I'm, I'm definitely agreeable with it. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to make a motion. I'm actually going to make a motion for section 420 village residential and section 425 village residential dash two to change the lot density percentages to 50% residential lot coverage. I'm sorry. <sighs> sorry. Lot coverage um, to 50% and remove the non-residential clause in the section 420. I'll second that motion. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 So I neglected to put on here that we had changed the commercial districts, so residential commercial, section 430, 
I neglected to even put on here that that was changed to 75%, but I got to go look up what it currently is. Um, and um, I sent a message to regional because there wasn't a distinction between commercial and residential, like the chart. I thought my word hadn't showed me that chart, but we had discussed it with regional that everything in the commercial district now could be um, multi-use. So you could have commercial on the bottom and then houses on the top. So they didn't want to distinguish in the commercial district. They didn't want us to distinguish and we agreed between commercial and residential because we want to encourage mixed use. So it would just be one chart now of what's allowed in the commercial district. But I just want to look online and see what it currently is. Fifty percent currently. Fifty percent residential and thirty percent non-residential. That makes sense. Okay. So this is the main district here, coming through town. I don't believe there's any houses left on Main Street except for one that's maybe for sale. Mr. Silvestri. I just add, so if you look down Main Street in the RC district, I think you're going to find the majority of lots are already above the 50 and even the proposed 75% lot coverage. Thank you. Do you is there, I have a question. I think Prospect Street, and there's another part of Smith Street, or one side of it, is also in the village residential commercial. Yes, that's correct. It goes I up to Smith Street. Prospect Street, when they came in, mm -hmm. there was an issue because people were concerned on the amount of traffic that could go on that street. Is it the whole street, Ryan, that's on the- On, uh, on Smith Street, I believe I believe it is. The other the other area that it's split is on Pleasant Street, right at the corner of Depot. Yeah, so it's going and, down, going and down. And Prospect Street, I think the entire street is residential yeah, it's commercial. Street, yeah. yeah. It's back of Main Street, it's commercial on Pleasant Street, and the other side is residential. So there, this district most assuredly has water and wastewater. Yeah. Cup. Yes. Yep, if they're not hooked up, they have the ability to, without a doubt. So I think we should entertain getting rid of the non-residential versus residential percentages like we did Absolutely. in the previous. I also think that we should probably, this one should be the highest percentage, um, would be my opinion on it. Do you feel any different toward those other little streets that would be included in it or not? I'm just asking. Like on Prospect Street, I know there's three building lots out there right now. Most are already, some of those lots are in the ones on Prospect Street, the three lots there that are for sale, that's in this district currently, or is that? It is that, in this district, district now. It is in this. I, I, I got the map up right now. It is, so it actually is not. Yeah, it's the it's other side of the one. river. So the Pros, Prospect Street is not in the RC. It's, it's in oh, regular right. residential, I believe. Yes, it is. That's really good because when they, they but they came in with Okimo, so what it was district is it in? It's in uh, regular residential. It's in village, 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 village R. Okay. Yep. Hmm. Um, but let's walk through this for a moment, Julia. I like your train of thought. So, How? if there's a lot that comes up, um, they're able to, if they put affordable housing, if it's at fifty percent, get up to ninety percent lot coverage. If we pass it at fifty. Um, and if they were to build just a house, it would be 50% without that extra 40. Mm -hmm. That's very fair. Now, 50% is, if I'm thinking about my house, I think I'm probably a little over 50% of my lot because I have a quarter acre as well. Um, actually, no, I believe I actually have a third. I think I have a third of an acre there. Anyway. Um, You're probably over. I think I'm over 50 with the driveway and the garage. 
I think it should be a little higher on this one myself, I believe. I'm sorry uh, to keep you waiting, um, Mrs. Carter. The Regional Planning Commission wanted this one to be at 75%. That was the recommendation. Great. Um, Seventy-five percent. What are your thoughts on seventy-five percent here? I mean, you, you, if you looked at even most of the houses on, on uh, Smith Street, they're they're probably close to seventy-five percent right now. <laughs> I would imagine so. Um, yeah, I, in in downtown, definitely, um, it's more than that. It's going to be more than that. Um, which, which is where we want the density. Um, you want to keep it at seventy-five? Is that what we're thinking? Right. I'm fine. I do because you're not you're not going down Prospect, which has a lot more green space. So. You can always redraw these uh, districts, correct? If there's a if there seems to be persistent issues with these new regulations, you can redraw the district map. Um, yeah, we can do that. We can do that. Yeah. Mr. Silvestri. So, yeah, I've, I've seen that done, but the only way you can really do that is if the the change is, is it's contiguous, so they, they the districts meet up to one another. Yeah. So, like, you could jump across the river and grab Prospect Street because on the other side of the river it is the RC, but you couldn't jump up to like Orion. I'm just as an example. You can't because bunny it's, hop because it. it's detached. Okay. I mean, it, I guess you could, but that is like clearly the definition of spot zoning, which is not. Yeah, is, is not really what we should be looking to do. Okay. Thank you. I'm sorry, Ryan. When you were saying Prospect Street, the side that's on the river is residential commercial. Nope. So all of Prospect Street right now is Village R, Village Residential, but the other side of the river is is uh, residential commercial. So as an example, if you want to extend the RC district to Prospect Street, that would work because it's already contiguous. It's already touching the RC district. But you couldn't bring RC up to Orion. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. Because there's nothing built on that side except for that one house on the very yep. end. No, and then and then the bank. majority of that bank is just for density for the other side. So that's how he was able to create those three lots as they also have land across the road going down to the river. Yeah, that's how they did it. They, yeah. They did it. Yeah, but that's definitely not developable. Um, this is kind of a new frontier uh, for Vermont and for this town in particular. So that's why I asked that question, Mr. Silvestri. Yeah. Um, I want to know what we as a town uh, can do if there's some unforeseen situations that may arise. Um, I'm, I'm actually thinking 75%, uh, which is um, quite a difference than what I thought I was going to. I'll second that. Are you making a motion? motion? I'll make a motion to <laughs> increase the lot coverage size under section 430 village residential commercial to 75%. I'll second that. Oh, and I also further want to get rid of the non-residential versus residential uh, percentages and just have a uniform 75%. My second one, I include that. Okay, any Except more discussion? I made that one nice and hard on you, Lish, sorry. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. So, village signs, section 540, slash bylaws. Yes, Miss Carter. Okay, so this whole sign section was worked on for months and months during the pandemic, I think it was, through Zoom meetings when Alan Couch was the chair. And um, it, has, it has a lot of changes, but it wasn't anything that this planning commission currently worked on. I think, well, Ryan, were you around for the sign stuff? Ryan and I were around during COVID for this sign stuff. A lot of this was things that rose 
um, you know, had ideas about that she wanted us to change, issues that she's had. Nine pages. Yeah. It's nine pages of sign regulations. I just want to let that sink in. It's nine. Which nine? <laughs> <laughs> I believe it starts in section 540, Mr. Brand. I would uh, refer you to the uh, index or the table of contents. Um, I have a sign that will be affected with these, so I'm going to recuse myself from the vote. Um, however, I do want to uh, be here for the conversation because this is important. We have one of the largest businesses in town, Shaw's, that just reopened after a devastating flood. Thank you very much for opening up and being part of our community. But the sign still says video stop. So we have nine pages of proposed sign changes, yet we have a 30-year-old sign still up at our major hub of a grocery store. So. I, I see some benefit in creating more or restructuring some signs, um, but I also see maybe uh, that we've gone a, a wee bit overboard in the, in the sign um, department, but that's just my, my take. Yes. Okay, so actually we did make a few changes on here. And they were vetted through Chris Callahan. Um, one of them was uh, to not allow vulgar signs like, and, but, and he said that freedom of speech is still gonna get them, but it's okay that we left that in there, just so you know. And we also, Rose wanted us to put something about um, signs that are like oscillating lights around the sign that's on the front of the building. And we added something in there about that too. So we did work on this. There's a lot of prohibited signs. Um, and it, again, I think signs as a citizen here, I think that it can get out of, out of balance, too many signs. I love the fact that there's not many signs. I love the fact that Vermont doesn't allow billboards. I think all those things are great. Um, but I also think that some signs bring life and vibrancy to communities. Uh, so I'd hate to just not see any signs or any sign of showing that we're open as a community and come and visit and check out all the main attractions, I guess. I don't know. That's my own feeling. I think a lot of signage stuff was to sort of set a climate in town. Um, and I think that that's something that we can do better and that's what we can do. Alan Isaacson. <laughs> Thank you, Lish. We were kind of with him. His whole thing was nobody's ever going to go for design review, so let's make this media enough, media enough to create a climate in town. It's not about like neon signs and oscillating signs. And some of them are illegal anyway from the state because they distract the drivers. Like the thing that we added about oscillating lights yeah. distracts drivers. So sure. We added that because it. We have a lot of convenience stores and gas stations in town that probably utilize a lot of neon signs. I actually don't ever look in their windows, so I don't know. Um, but that would, this would effectively ban any of those signs. Inter internally, the signs and windows are legal right now. This but once this, it. yeah, this would ban it. So but anybody that already had them would be grandfathered. Would be grandfathered in. Yeah. Huh. Well, that doesn't fix the problem at all. <laughs> Just to let you know, <laughs> in my opinion, uh, Miss uh, Childs. Hi. Abby Childs, East Lake Road. Is there currently any type of board or a system where signs for businesses or small and large have to get their signs passed through the town? Yes, through yeah. the zoning department. Okay, and are there restrictions on um, design aesthetics that the town is currently following? Not to my knowledge. There's uh, definitely limits on size. Mm -hmm. um, there's limit on secondary signs, and there's limits on how you can illuminate said signs. Okay. I think that covers the gist of it, though. Like, I know my daughter and John broke up Johnny's. You can have 30 square feet, 
you have a sign total, mm -hmm. so they would maybe have a sandwich board out there, yeah. sign on the building, sign on the front. Okay. We're all in that third square feet. Okay. Um, I just bring this up because as a graphic designer, I, I look at signage all the time. Um, and I wonder if the town could have someone like me on board where um, it's a resource for small businesses that are opening business and need new signage, like the um, the old lobster shack that's now the donut and breakfast sandwich place. I actually don't know what it's called. I apologize. New England. But yeah, New Cider England Cider Donuts. Cider yeah. donuts. Um, I noticed, you know, they have... Um, kind of like a makeshift sign, it seems, for the, maybe the meantime or maybe that's long term. But I think for the aesthetics and setting the tone for the town, especially, you know, for this business and in, in, in this case, it's right on the end, you know, as you're entering town. Um, but I would love to like s love to see somebody have a role where they have a they have a designer that's there for them and can create some nice, like clear, cohesive aesthetics for the town. Um and also have an equal playing field so that no matter if you have startup funds or not, um, you can have someone, someone like me or someone else, but um, to just help guide people and be just a resource and not, um, you know, play favorites or, or some, some small businesses don't have the money to invest in those things. So just something I've been thinking about for a long time. Thank you, Miss yeah. Giles. Thank you. I could not agree more with like beautification projects, uh, you know, aesthetically pleasing signs in proper paint and colors and always maintained. I love all those things. Um, but I am a little, little worried at nine pages of sign, sign regulations myself. Mr. Pullinan. Oh, yes. Yes. Can I just yes. Yes, please. Where my question lands, maybe it's not. Um, I'm actually here on behalf of the Expeditionary School, and you know we have a board out in front that you have to go out and put in letters that nobody can really see. And we we're thinking about the possibility of maybe putting up an electronic sign. I know that's like a no, no, maybe, but I'm wondering how we would go about the process of. Well, you caught us in a perfect this? time. <laughs> um, okay. I believe uh, Mrs. Carter might be able to better answer your question, but I, I think an electronic sign would be a no-go uh, under these current regs, or the new regs. The current right. regs, I believe they are a go. Look, right, looking at the regs, I know there's exceptions for state and town. Mr. Um, Silvestri might be able to did, help. Did I that, I believe, Terry, didn't, didn't we put in that the municipal property was exempt? Yes, for marquee signs, so that would be a municipal property. Yeah. Yep. Oh, great. That is a town so property, believe, so you'd I be able in the exemptions section. That Thank you. Is. So great. Where do I channel the request for that? Rose Gold. <laughs> Through uh, the zoning administrator in their office. Oh, behind you. Sharing the song with everybody. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes. Go outside where it's a little cooler, huh? Thank you very much. Thank you. If, if I may, I just want to say, you know, hopefully today, I hope that you guys will send the bylaws to the public hearing. And at that public hearing, you could also address the sign section as long as it occurred during the public hearing. Just so you know. Um, Changes could be made as long as it happened during the public hearing. <laughs> I, I realize there's a lot on the signs, um, but there's also a lot of different signs. And uh, I'm sure you've, you've put your work in um, to research all those. So, um, yeah. um, it, it, it is a pretty overwhelming to try to read through it, but. Um, <laughs> And I, but I don't know if you can simplify it much. Go ahead. Um, I wasn't on the planning commission at that time, but I've been on the planning commission in the years past, and signage is very difficult. I think that's probably why there are nine line items on there, because, and especially in our town and primarily the village. You, there are so many different types of signs. So to Abby's point, wouldn't it be nice to have some kind of continuity um, 
I know internally lit signs just keep coming up and coming up. This is in the village with no, um, and they're not a designation sign either. They're a, I don't know what they are, but you all see them. So that's a good idea to let everybody have their input. But I can understand how the whole sign discussion got about nine line items on it because it is not. Mr. Spencer. Yes, Ryan. Yep. So the only other thing, we, we touched on this in the Planning Commission. So yeah, there's just a lot of signs. So that's why there's there's a lot of language. Um, I've seen in other towns and other states where they have uniformity in all of their signs because the municipality provides them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's kind of, you get away from design review, but obviously it's, you know, you got to talk about cost and then obviously talking about replacing already existing signs. But, you know, you, you have your your picturesque, you know, movie towns that all the signs are the same. That's because the town supplies all the signs, all the signs. And I, we're, if you guys move forward with this, it is also grandfathered in, remember. So it, does that mean that a place with flashing lights on Tuesday at 6 p.m. will still have those flashing lights on Wednesday at 6 p.m.? Not flashing lights, because that's the state. Thank you, sir. Distraction Okay. Thank you. You could grandfather them with a time limit. Grandfather them for five years or whatever is reasonable. Is that something so the planning commission would do, or is that something we would do on the floor right now? Probably you guys it would be do that. We have to yeah. I have. Um, so if you were grandfathered in with the sign you had, and someone bought your business, would that would that negate the grandfather that you'd have to follow these rules? I don't know. I think it would because it would be a new operating company. They'd have to apply for that. So often how, how you sort of do away with the grandfathering is, is change of use, change of occupancy, uh, renovations to at a certain extent that triggers you bring it up to whatever the, the current oh, okay. code is. So if, if I, you know, bought pot belly pig there and I wanted to make it into a bagel shop, you know, now I have to go by the, the current regulations, even though there's a sign there currently. Yeah. Just a point of interest on um, Sunoco, when they came into zoning, they conformed with all the sign regulations. They took down all their signs and put the one up yeah. to conform with the sign regulations in town. So people are respectful of that sometimes. But Ryan, do you know that? Does, are they grandfathered? I don't know if they, he knows more. Well, that's something I guess we can, we would have time to figure out. Um, what do you think about the, uh, the sign package, Julie? I think they worked in a long time, more than we have, you know, so I don't, I have to respect that. Is that thunder? Yeah. Wow. It's supposed to be something. That's why I drove. Let's break that humidity. <laughs> Um, do I have a motion? You recused yourself. Yes, I'm recused. Are we making a motion to accept the sign, or are we going to ask the, tent, the village? We're, so we're just uh, doing all this stuff, and then it's going to get moved along. So. I'm hoping you guys will look at the public hearing. We have yep. that over, and I think things still change the public hearing. So I didn't make a motion that this goes to a public hearing. Is that the motion? I don't know. Yes, you can. Uh, that we accept. That we accept the. This is, is written. Okay, I'll make that motion. Is that okay? Alicia. Alicia knows how to write it. Yeah. And, uh, and they'll go to the I public. I would here. second that. Okay. So, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, village bylaws. And other issues. Yeah, I'm wondering if you guys would, you know, make a motion to hold the public hearing 
There's just, just one thing Earl that too. I would like to double check, yeah. and it's it my it alludes to my question earlier. Are other towns disagreeing with the state over those? And I, I don't know. you spoke with Chris Callahan months ago. That's a weird thing to say. Yeah. Irks me personally. Um, but if uh, we'd like to, Mr. Silvestri. Kind of throw a little context in there. So, I mean, it's, it's state statute. So you got to understand that by not following state statute, the town's breaking the law, opening it up to the secret audit by the Secretary of State's office. So, like, I'm not, I don't know if there would be consequences, but it's, I think in my, my read on Chris Callahan was more of his opinion in kind of poking holes in how it was written, you know, like, you know, I could write a better type of, type of thing, um, as opposed to Ludlow shouldn't follow state law. <laughs> so let's just, uh, you just basically, you don't want to follow it. Here's, here's how you don't have to follow it. Yeah, yeah. That's how you do it. Uh, again, at, at, at risk of prosecution from the state, so. I will make a motion um, to hold a public hearing for these amended village bylaws. Um, I'm not going to set a date. I'm just going to give you uh, the general motion that we'd like to move forward with this. So that's my motion. I'll second that. Okay. Any more discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. And you just have one question. You guys, it's not on the agenda. I just haven't thought of it. But um, Brandon, he came to us and said, like, his whole family's on the thing, right? Um, Brandon came to us and said, well, he's going to take a look at the junkyard ordinance. And we don't write ordinances. You guys do. Which ordinance? The junkyard. The junkyard ordinance. Junkyard. Because he's had some complaints and stuff. And he just wanted us to take a look at it and start the conversation. So we did. Brian did some research, I did some research. And so what we want to come to you guys and ask you is, do you, we're not, if we, the ordinance needs to be rewritten, we don't do that anymore. This ordinance is not our, um, our, in our wheelhouse. But if you wanted us to write a bylaw, then we would do that, and we would spend time doing that. So before we spend time doing that, we want to know if that's something you want us to do. Montpelier, the only time I can find a remote that has a bylaw about junk yards is Montpelier. So on the bylaw, the bylaw, as you know, will be reinforced by Jeremy Rose. An ordinance is reinforced by the town manager, and you can get the bill to the police to, um, to, you know, to enforce the ordinance. So before we sit down and write a bylaw, we want to know if that's what we want us to do. We want us to do nothing to support things to have Personally, I believe that's an ordinance issue, not a bylaw issue. At which point, 
we would follow the proper channels to get that ordinance drafted. Usually the lawyer would be involved in drafting that ordinance. Mr. Callahan. Um, that would be that would be my recommendation is to do a junkyard ordinance, not a bylaw. Thank you. I think that was a really wise decision. Yeah. Talk to the Yeah. So, so I guess we will work on an ordinance for that. Okay. Okay. And, uh, keep up. Keep up your your work on this. Um, Thank you. <laughs> this. So. Last one. I call that other business. Yeah, I don't have any other business. Myself. I have a motion. I make a motion to adjourn tonight's meeting. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye.